Hey guys, it's Adam Lavelle from WrestlingDoneRight.com. We're here today to cover AEW Rampage from this past Friday, December 23rd. This show kicked off with the Trios Battle Royal for $300,000. And I'm sure this is also going to lead to the winners getting a title shot down the line once this Best of Seven series is over between the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, the Elite, against Death Triangle, Pac, Penta, and Phoenix. I'm sure it's going to lead that. That wasn't announced, but it only makes sense to me. Uh, this match just kicked off with pure chaos. Numerous guys in the ring. This is the third time I've started recording the coverage of this match, guys. I was trying to sort of go over the, the process of eliminations and the order of the teams that came in, and it's pretty difficult to do. Even though I watched the show twice and I have a lot of screenshots and some notes written down, I'm not going to cover it in that way. I'm going to tell you that this was a top-notch battle royal with a lot of stories being told. Old. You saw one of the one of the best stories being told here is the possible battle for the Ring of Honor Championship between Roosh and Claudio Castagnoli. Those two got into it about the middle of the match, going nose to nose, face to face. They are two guys that have held the Ring of Honor Championship two times. That's a rare feat. I, there's only a few other guys who have done it off the top of my head. I know um, Jay Briscoe's one of them. I know Austin Aries is one of them. There have been very few guys who have held the Ring of Honor title more than once. Roosh and Claudio Castagnoli are two of them. That's an interesting thing that came out of that. that. The continual feud, the continual hatred, the continual fighting between Kip Sabian and Orange Cassidy was another thing that progressed here, that went further here in this matchup. And it was interesting. It actually cost both of them any real opportunity in this match. They were so focused on each other. They were so single-minded in this matchup. They were both eliminated fairly early and just fought each other up the ramp. That's all they were concerned about. This showed you the story of Dark Order getting some blows in, getting some payback on Preston Vance, the man who left the Dark Order and joined La Faccione Ingubernables with Roosh and Dralistico. And the crowd went wild when Dark Order, when Uno, uh, John Silver, and Alex Reynolds came in and began a serious beatdown on Preston Vance. But to Preston Vance credit, knowing this was a battle royal, he dropped down and just let these guys kick and punch away. And while that would bring him much pain and discomfort, they weren't going to eliminate him from the match in this way. And he survived for, for quite some time. When the Blackpool Combat Club came out and it was their turn to enter the ring, the crowd, of course, popped huge for John. On Moxley, Wheeler, Utah, and Claudio, Claudio Castagnoli. I talked already about Castagnoli and Roosh getting into it. Of course, it was after they come, came into the match, so I'm not doing this in any particular order. I'm just telling you some of the hottest stuff in here. Uh, also, SAP, a faction. I'm not real crazy about that being Luther, Pentico, and... Of course, Angelico. I like Angelico a lot. This guy didn't last a minute or two in this match. He was eliminated fairly quickly. I don't know why Angelico isn't used in a better way with AEW. I will admit, I don't think he's used properly. I don't like this SAP faction. I don't feel Angelico really mixes well with them other than he speaks Spanish. I just don't get it. He should be a bigger guy. He should be more important in my opinion. La Faccione Ingo Bernables was the big part of this match. Them and Blackpool Combat Club, I would say, were very heavily featured here, not just against each other, but against everyone else and they did cause a lot of eliminations during this matchup Orange Cassidy, before he was eliminated had the bright idea to come off the top turnbuckle and was caught in, out of the midair by Claudio Castagnoli, Alex Reynolds, and Evil Uno and dumped out. And Kip Sabian was dumped out shortly after. And like I said, those two fought up the ramp. Claudio was just sort of shrugging that off after it happened. Arrogantly, very cocky attitude, which I like from Claudio Castagnoli. Roosh eliminated the pure champion, Wheeler Yuta, after that running drop kick, that bull's horns, whatever he calls it, rush drop kick into the corner. To his seated opponent and just picked up Wheeler Yuta and tossed him out, I believe, adding fuel to the fire of Roosh versus Claudio Castagnoli. I just think that makes sense. Um, Roosh and Preston Vance very arrogantly celebrated much of the time here. Whenever Top Flight and AR Fox was introduced, the crowd was very happy about that. They came out together. They were one of the last teams to come out here, if not the last team. I like this team. Uh, Somebody on Twitter I saw, I have it on my, um, I retweeted it and it's on my Facebook because I'm sorry, I can't remember the gentleman's name, suggested that this team be called Star Fox. 
you know, the old Nintendo game. I like that idea as long as the Nintendo lawyers would leave it alone. I would love to see that happen. Who knows if it will, but I, I'm going to call them Star Fox just because I like it. The fight continued. The varsity athletes came out. They were quickly eliminated by the Martin Brothers by top flight. Josh Woods was pretty much just dumped over the top rope by them. And Anthony Nice had the idea to come off the top turnbuckle. But just as he lapped, the Martin Brothers got to him and gave him a gigantic shove. And out he flew over the top rope on to Josh Woods and smart Mark Sterling. They were out of it almost as quickly as they came in. Now, Claudio and Moxley managed to eliminate Preston Vance. They teamed up together and got him out of there again, adding fuel to the fire of the Blackpool Combat Club versus La Faccione Ingo Bernabli's, especially Rouge versus Claudio Castagnoli. There was a really wicked moment that saw the butcher eliminated by Trent Beretta whenever Trent gave him a wicked sit down pile driver on the ring apron. I mean, that just crumpled the big butcher and he fell to the floor. Trent was soon eliminated after that himself, though, as Roosh and Claudio Castagnoli got into it once again, battling all around the ring, worked themselves onto the ring apron where the battle was won by Claudio Castagnoli, eliminating Roosh from this match. A.R. Fox climbed to the ropes and went to do a jumping, a leaping maneuver that he is so famous for onto John Moxley. But Moxley saw it coming, ran over, nailed Fox with a forearm shot as he was coming off, causing Fox to fly over the top rope and be eliminated, making this match come down to the Blackpool Combat Club, two of them, Claudio Castagnoli and John Moxley, against top flight, two of them, because AR Fox was eliminated, um, Darius and Dante Martin. Now, look, these Martin kids, like them or not, they are doing a hell of a job. I mean, they are all over these shows. They are impressive. They beat the kingdom on the Ring of Honor final battle pay-per-view. They are looking really good here. And for them to be two of the last men standing, when they had guys like La Faccione, Ingo Bernables, and the Butcher and the Blade and Kip Sabian, and they had teams like that in here dark order no it came down to blackpool combat club guys that you would expect to get to the end and possibly win this and the martin brothers top light and the the fight was on until hangman adam page makes his way to the ring and gets into a huge brawl with john moxley now you have to give page credit he did stay out of this until dark order was eliminated he didn't come in here and cost his friends the match I mean, you got to give him credit for that because he could have just lost his cool and came in here and, and tried to get stuff done what in the middle while his while his guys the dark order were in there and could have won it and cost them it or something like that but no he wanted to cost the blackpool combat club this so again this is not just john moxley versus adam page in my opinion this could be dark order versus blackpool combat club which would be interesting i don't really see it being a whole big contest for blackpool combat club but hey it could happen but anyhow moxley and page just get into it fighting all over the place and as this is happening top light the martin brothers using their smarts just nailed John Moxley with one of their aerial maneuvers, pretty big drop kick, I believe it was, knocking him over the top rope. He was distracted, not paying attention, not bracing himself, and out he went over the top rope. Very smart move by the Martin Brothers of Top Flight. That leaves Top Flight versus Claudio Castagnoli, and this was awesome. Claudio Castagnoli displayed strength that he's famous for. I mean, he manhandled these brothers for a while, picked them both up at the same time, tossed them around like they were bags of flour, had little issue with them, numerous times almost had them both tossed over the top rope at the same time. But the Martin brothers, being so skilled on the ropes the way that they are, being tightrope walkers, basically being able to navigate the ring on the ropes like few people in this business can do, caught themselves and managed to keep themselves from being eliminated. But to Claudio Castagnoli's credit, he did the same thing. While he's far from a high flyer, his strength, his pure unadulterated strength allowed him to grab the ropes and keep from being tossed even by two men at the same time at one point Clastagnoli even had one of the martin brothers up over his head and looked like he was going to run and toss him over the top rope but instead the other martin brother 
super kicked him, knocking him down. And they clothesline Claudio Castagnoli over the top rope. But again, Castagnoli not only held on, he got back into the ring and came at these guys again, got them in the, got an advantage, looked like he was going to hit the big swing on one of them. But instead, the other brother came up and pushed his brother who was in the, the big swing position, pushed him up and backwards and down over the ropes they all three went this time claudio castagnoli not able to hold on falls to the arena floor giving the win to darius and dante martin of top flight ar fox hits the ring because he is part of that team and even though he was eliminated your team is not eliminated unless all three men are tossed so ar fox is back to celebrate their victory i'm going to call him star fox it's unofficial as unofficial gets Top Flight and AR Fox are winners of the $300,000 and not officially named the new number one contenders because you don't know who the new, if there's going to be new champions, if um, Death Triangle will retain the championship. But no matter what happens there, if their next match, the winner of that best of seven series, the Elite or Death Triangle, their next match are against Star Fox, the name I'm using for AR Fox and Top Flight. That's going to be money. That is going to be a great match, and AR Fox deserves it. I'm not taking anything away from the Martin brothers. They are looking like the Rock and Roll Express here. Now, I'm not comparing them. What I'm saying is the way the Rock and Roll Express came into JCP and were used heavily and got the titles right away and got in big feuds with the Russians and the Horsemen, that's how I see the Martin brothers being used here. They're young kids, fly all over the ring, fast as hell, and Tony Khan and AEW are being like, we're going to use these kids. We're going to push them to the moon. And AR Fox is in the midst of that, a longtime independent veteran, I think deserving of such a thing. And seeing these three guys against either the Elite or Death Triangle will be money it will be more money than what they want here the three hundred thousand dollars i would really like this match it told lots of stories it showed a lot of potential feuds blackpool combat club against the martin brothers against dark order against um la, la faccione ingo bernables we got um Bruce versus Claudio Castagnoli. We have uh, any member of the Dark Order going against Preston Vance. We got the continuation of Orange Cassidy and Kip Sabian. We got the continuation of John Moxley and Hangman Adam Page. This was great. It was a great way to kick off the show. It was a very entertaining battle royal, which normally I'm not into at all. Battle royals typically bore me. This was not boring. This was worth watching. This is worth paying attention to. And this is worth talking about. What does the future hold for all of these guys? Out of all the interactions you saw here, what do the winners have next? I'm predicting they're going to face the winners of this best of seven series. I really think that's where this is going to lead. I, I think we're going to see all kinds of stuff spin out of this. It really worked well. I really enjoyed it great stuff next up on the show we had eddie kingston and ortiz hit the ring they had some words to say they wanted to speak out they wanted to call out the house of black now guys i have nothing against the house of black i think they could be a terrific faction i'm not really into creepy crawly spooky things all right i'm cool with them if they don't cross a line if they don't get into the mystical and the supernatural and guys bleeding from their eyes and shit like that as long as we don't go overboard like that i'm cool with it and the house of black is on record with saying something something like and i'm paraphrasing here because i don't remember but it's something like this isn't about being scary this is about being violent i'm okay with that I'm okay with that. I would rather see violence, chairs, tables, and even though I'm not really super into that either, I'm okay with that over the supernatural for sure. So Ortiz and Kingston are out here to say, hey, we're sick of your crap before the lights go out like we had a power outage or like we didn't pay the electric bill. Why don't you get out here now? We want to deal with you now. And that leads to the one and only Julia Hart. I mean, she's pretty cool. I like this chick standing there in her wide brim hat and her black outfit pointing up to the mega screen, pointing up to the Megatron. What's going to appear up there? Of course, it's going to be the House of Black. All three members standing there with a response. And now Mr. Black himself, the leader, says something like, hey, if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then what is the friend of my enemy? Or some, I don't know, some kind of mumbo jumbo, if you will. But he's basically sowing seeds of doubt in the relationship of Eddie Kingston and Ortiz. Now, that led to a cutback to 
Kingston and Ortiz sort of having a spirited discussion, if you will. Ortiz being like, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? Because obviously the last time the House of Black came out and, and, and attacked some people, they when they got to Ortiz, who was out there, they, they, they started to attack him very gently, like they were going to body slam or something. And instead... They set him down gently and didn't do anything to him. So that sows the seeds of doubt, right? What's going on? What's going on? Why didn't they hurt him? Why didn't they, why didn't they beat him down? Well, that might, might, might say to you, well, maybe he's going to join the House of Black. Maybe he's going to surprise Eddie Kingston. Well, my question to you is, how do we know this? How do we know it's not Eddie Kingston? Now, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense for an independent, tough New Yorker like Eddie Kingston to join the House of Black, but we don't know what's going on. I don't think we, I th it could have been a little game that the House of Black were playing when they set Ortiz down. Maybe they just wanted to, that, that's there in Eddie Kingston's way of doing this. Because if there's one thing Eddie Kingston is and can be, it is all about the violence, right? I don't see him wearing face paint and coming out and looking like a druid or anything like that. But could I see him being interested in that stable if it meant he was just going to come out and beat somebody's ass and be as violent as violent gets? I, hey, maybe. Maybe. I'm not going to rule out that this is about Eddie Kingston joining the House of Black. I think it'd be a little different. It'd be a little odd, but it might work. I'm just throwing that out there. What do you guys think? Do you think we're going to see that? Do you think we're going to see Ortiz join the House of Black? To tell you the God's honest truth, I don't see either of these guys really gelling well with those guys. But maybe, maybe, like I said, if the House of Black is not about being spooky, it's about being violent, then hell yes, I can see Eddie Kingston fitting in. We'll just have to wait and see what's up with this, but... It's interesting. Next, Renee Paquette was there with an interview with Jericho Appreciation Society's Sammy Guevara and Daniel Garcia. Now, of course, we all know that Chris Jericho, the man himself right here, has told Daniel Garcia that he is going to basically be the protege, the shadow of Sammy Guevara, that he could learn a lot from Sammy. Now, Daniel Garcia is basically, but not basically, he flat out tells Sammy Guevara here, I don't really like you. I don't like you. I don't like how you look. I don't like how you dress. I don't like your stupid hair, but I'm going to be a professional and I'm going to work with you. And Guevara's like, okay, you're going to be a professional, are you? I'll tell you what, what your problem is. You're a tight ass, which I thought, well, he doesn't like to spend his money. No, no. He means he's wound tight. You know, he, he's wound up. He, he just, he, he's not loose. He's got to loosen up. That's what Sammy Guevara is telling him. You got you to get with the program. You got to loosen up. I think you need a hug. And for a moment, I'm thinking, what the hell is this? Best friends? Is this a best friend segment? What's going on here? But Guevara actually reaches out and hugs Daniel Garcia. I think this was a psychological move. I think this is them just trying to get in the head of Daniel Garcia, trying to reinforce that, you know, Sammy Guevara is the boss and he's going to make Daniel Garcia as uncomfortable as he can as part of his being his leader, his trainer, his shadow, if you will. And he's just going to try to make him uncomfortable, grabs him by the shoulders then, has a little pep talk with him. We're going to do great things. This is going to be great. And Daniel Garcia just looking like, yeah, okay, to the point that when Guevara walks off, Rene Paquette actually looks at Garcia and is like, are you okay? You know, you, everything all right? And it pretty much fades out from there. So we're clearly sowing some seeds of dissent here as well, much like the last segment in a slightly different way. That's the thing when you've got factions, when you've got groups, when you've got families, as was put here by Sammy Guevara, that the JAS is a family. Well, look, if you think you can't have family problems, I don't know what family you've ever come from. And there's all kinds of problems brewing among factions in AEW. And a lot of people be like, oh, that's too same -sy. Well, to me, it's, it's realistic. If you're going to have wrestlers grouping up teaming up trying to build teams which makes sense you know there's they're strength in numbers you're also going to have issues and problems from time to time some they'll get over some they won't i mean keith lee and shane strickland you know now we've got um eddie kingston and ortiz we've got sammy guevara and daniel garcia i don't really have a problem with it to me it reflects normalcy it reflects might what might actually happen in real life in these ego driven situations how is everybody going to get along perfectly all of the time when they're charismatic, arrogant, prideful, professional wrestlers? There's not. They're not. And there's going to be issues. And sometimes it might lead to a breakup. Sometimes it may not. So I don't have a problem with any of these situations. It actually adds a little bit of flavor to the company, if you ask me. 
Next up, guys, we had Jade Cargill, the TBS champion. That's the women's television champion with her baddies, if you will, Red Velvet and Layla Gray coming to the ring. They're going to, she's not defending that title. This is a title eliminator match, meaning as she faces these women along the way, anyone that defeats her or the first one that defeats her will receive a future shot at that TBS championship. The problem is this woman is undefeated. Undefeated. It's like 60 some and oh, nobody's touching Jade Cargill. Now, here's the thing. We're going to peek behind the curtains a little bit here, which I don't like to do too much on this show because I want to be a fan. I don't want to be an expert or a wannabe expert, if you will. She's facing Vert Vixen. And the thing is, when you get somebody as new to the wrestling industry as Jade Cargill, no matter how good she's been, no matter how many matches she's won, no matter what title she's held, she's still new to the business and she's still somewhat green, if you will. I don't mean that as an insult. I just, I'm just spitting facts because I'm the most honest wrestling journalist in the world. She's green. She's, a, she's an attraction. She's a feature, but she's green. So you got to put her in there with some other ladies that can make her look better than she is. And Vert Vixen is one of them. Vert Vixen, I hope, is getting a hard look by Tony Khan and AEW because in this match, she made Jade Cargill look like the million dollars this company wants her to look like. Jade Cargill controlled this match. She woman-handled Vert Vixen all match long. Vert Vixen made that possible, though. Vert Vixen took a green wrestler like Jade Cargill, as good as she looks, as big as she is, as tough as she is, as much of the TBS champion of that belt she totes, totes around. She needs some help in the ring. She just does. And anybody in her situation would. That's not an insult to her at all. I see what they're doing with her. I'm not against what they're doing with her. But as they do what they want to do with Jade Cargill, they need help along the way. And boy, did Vert Vixen give it here. This was an interesting, pretty much squash match because of Vert Vixen's abilities to make it look like it did. And it was, like I said, it was just Jade Cargill controlling the whole entire thing, including through a commercial break. Now, that takes a lot of faith, too. Now, this is in Jade Cargill and Vert Vixen. It takes a lot of faith. If you are going to work a match through a break, when you're going over the program and you're setting things up, you know where these commercial breaks go. And if you're going to take a match like this through a break, you're saying, I believe our fans will stick around through this. They will not turn the channel. They will not lose interest and not come back. This match will go through a break. That's did it. I don't know how it did. I don't analyze ratings here because I'm a fan, not a wannabe producer or booker. All right. But I don't know. Did it hold the numbers? I don't know. But that's, that's a compliment to both these ladies to go through a break. It just is. But they came back just for Cargill to get a bunch of kicks in on Vert Vixen, including a big scissor kick and a big leaping crane style kick to the face. And that ended the match and gave the victory to the TBS champion, Jade Cargill. Now, Who's going to be the one who beats her? Someone's got to beat her. I mean, I, who wants to see a title eliminator tournament go through however many matches and there's no victor, so she doesn't get a new challenger? Someone's got to beat her so they can challenge her for this title. Who's it going to be? Some people think it's going to be um, Sasha Banks, whatever her real name is. I don't even remember. Uh, she's going to come in New Japan. She's in New Japan. Stardom really is where she's at. That's who's paying her salary. Um, she's there. I, I don't understand the deal completely. It's somewhat part-time. It's no way is it a full-time WWE style thing or a full-time star stardom wrestles unbelievable amount of shows per month. I think they wrestle at l shows at least four a month, maybe more. They're always performing and banks is not going to be on all those shows. She's going to be on a handful of a select few. Could um, she come to AEW through the forbidden door policy or because Tony Khan threw a couple dollars towards her signing? Maybe. I don't know. That would be interesting, at least. Um, I don't, I'm not one of these people who think Sasha Banks is one of the best wrestlers in the world. She's fine. She's good. She's better than Jade Cargill at this point, for sure. A lot better. Um, so it would be interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing that, but I'm not convinced that's what's going to happen. But someone has to come in here and beat her so she can have some type of challenger. No doubt about that. Next, we had several promos. We had one from the one and only Ruby Soho. 
She's back. She beat Tay Conte in her last match. She said, look, she thought it was over. She thought she could move on. She thought she could just pick up something else in her career, put that behind her. But no, no, Anna Jay had to come and interfere. And now she feels like she had to go out and get somebody to take her side, to stand with her against Conte, or which is mellow now, I guess it is, Ty Mello. Sorry. And um, Anna Jay, and she has chosen willow nightingale willow nightingale the the peppy excited i love her I, she does a great job i'm not a big baby face guy but she does such a great job out of i am a fan of her and they tease not tension but they tease the differences between the two like soho's like oh geez i don't want to fist bump you but willow just insists and she does at the end of the promo which is kind of cute and it's going to be a bunch of matches next week on dynamite which look amazing i'll do a dynamite preview show exclusively on my facebook you got to follow me there wrestling done you can find the link to my facebook but next wednesday it is going to be ruby soho and willow nightingale versus tay Mello and anna J. that should be a good matchup but it's also going to be match six falls count anywhere death triangle versus the elite and we're almost done with this series. I figure the Elite wins this, so we get a seventh match. Yes, I'm predicting it early, I guess, but I don't see any way it ends here. But you never know. They could they could just fool us, and it could end here. But that is going to be on the show next week. We're going to see Top Flight versus Claudio Castagnoli and John Moxley of the Blackpool Combat Club. We are going to see Ethan Page with Stokely Hathaway versus Brian Danielson. And we're going to see... For the TNT Championship, the champion Samoa Joe versus Wardlow. That is a hell of a show on the next Dynamite. Holy balls. I mean, we're going to go into the new year with AEW on fire. That is an incredible show. I'm not going to go over those again. I would like to because I'm excited by them. But I will bring you again my thoughts, a preview of this on Wednesday, probably 30 minutes before the show, exclusively on my Facebook page. And we had a little uh, promo from Wardlow reminding the king of television, his highness himself, Samoa Joe, that he never defeated him. He didn't pin him. He didn't make him tap out. So he walks around with a fake crown. It's not his crown. He did not take it rightly off of the former king, and he's coming to get it back. And that's going to be a great match. That is going to be two bull of the woods, daddy, going head to head, toe to toe to find out who will be the TNT champion. That is going to be great. But it's time for the main event, guys. Let's get into that. The main event, ladies and gentlemen, I freaking loved it. This was a tag team match extraordinaire. Now, yes, we didn't have both of the acclaimed because Daddy Ass had to take the, the part of an injured Max Caster teaming with Anthony Bowens, non-title match then, of course, against... Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett, managed by Sanjay Dutt and seconded to the ring by the mighty Singh, you know, the Satnam Singh, the huge one in a million, seven foot four guy. They are coming out here seriously wanting the tag team titles. I mean, and wouldn't it freak the IWC out if they would pull this off eventually? Of course, again, this is a non-title matchup, but it started out with Lethal in there against Bowens, and this was just... I don't want to say perfect, but this was a damn good tag team match. Damn good. Guys, get over your hatred of Jared and watch this. Watch this with wrestling eyes and a wrestling mind and tell me this wasn't just wonderful, wonderful stuff. Now, it was pretty much dominated by the heel team. The heel team who worked tremendously together, but they were also telling the story that Bowens was working without his regular partner, even though they're close with Daddy Az and he's their adopted daddy and all that kind of cute stuff. It's not who he's used to working with. And watch this and tell me Billy Gunn and Jeff Jarrett, two older gentlemen, and I'm 53, so it's not an insult, didn't perform wonderfully. Tell me they're not incredible workers. Some of you don't know the difference between performing and working. There are a lot of amazing performers in the world of wrestling today. Guys who can perform, especially if they get to rehearse ahead of time, amazingly. But there are very few workers left in wrestling that can get in there, call a match in the ring, and work it in a style where it looks like a fight, where it looks like a struggle and not a cooperative dance routine. And I'm not saying this is a hater of modern day wrestling. It's just a simple truth. 
Lethal and Jarrett dominated this with unbelievably good tag team strategies, tagging in and out all the time, keeping their opponent on their side of the ring and working them and wearing them down, keeping Bowens from tagging out and keeping Billy Gunn out of the ring for the lengthiest part of this match. It was, it was just a perfect job by the heels and doing little underhanded things here or there, but not really overly cheating throughout the match until the end. And we haven't got there yet, but this was great. They really put it in the heads of the acclaimed that they could be in trouble. Now, when Billy Gunn did get in, he got a hot tag. Imagine that. And he was fired up and he took the heels to school. He took them down and they did the little scissoring thing with Bowens before they did a double elbow drop on Jay Lethal. So they got the crowd fired up there, but. The challenger stormed back. Jeff Jarrett worked the crowd like the magician he is, like the last outlaw that he is. You can chant Jarrett sucks. You can chant TNA. You can chant whatever you want at this guy. But every time you're doing it, all you're saying is that he's doing his job because he knows how to do it. And he did it wonderfully here. He did it masterfully here. I, I, I call these guys the lethal outlaws. Jay Lethal, the out, last outlaw. Jeff Jarrett, the lethal outlaws. I'm naming teams tonight, baby. I love this. I loved how this matchup worked. Aud Audrey Edwards did her job amazingly well. Distracted at the right times. Back focused on the match at the right times, worked the match very strongly. They even talked about that on commentary with Jeff Jarrett saying how much she annoys him because he doesn't count to three fast enough and just putting it out there that she was doing a good job in this matchup. Billy Gunn got tagged back in again toward the end, looking like he was ready to take control, but here come big old Satnam Singh to, to, to run some interference there, but Billy Gunn clotheslined him out of the match, out of the ring. That was a pretty good spot because Billy Gunn is a pretty big guy himself. He's nowhere near 7'4", but he's probably 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He's a big guy. And he clotheslined old Singh over the top rope. Singh took, I don't want to call it a bump because he flipped over the rope and landed on his feet because he's so tall that all he has to do is rotate one time and bam, he's just standing up again. And that was impressive, but it was also impressive with Billy Gunn showing that he can be an equalizer against this giant, getting him out of the ring the way that he did. Billy Gunn then lifted up Lethal in what a ridiculous, like a half Nelson slam or something. It was impressive. Lethal took a hell of a bump out of it. And, but Bowens is in the ring to help chase Singh off, even though he had already been shoved out. I don't know why Bowens was in the ring, but Jarrett comes in and gives him the stroke down. He goes, goes this causes max caster to jump up on the rig apron to be like hey 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 get the get the heels under control get this under you had satin them singing here you have lethal and jared in here at the same time although bowens was in there as well max caster's all worked up he's young he's a rookie doesn't know any better he actually inadvertently distracts the ref audrey edwards and in comes the one and the only sanjay dutt with the ball shot to daddy ass allowing jay lethal to deliver the lethal injection and get the pin one, two, three on daddy ass defeating the acclaimed, not really officially, but close enough to tell the world they're coming for these tag team titles. Now I can remember watching tag team titles, tag team matches when I was a kid. Okay. I can remember a couple of them. I can remember Kurt Heading, Mr. Perfect before he was Mr. Perfect and Scott Hall before he was a yo defeat the road warriors for the AWA world titles. People could not believe it. I can remember Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake defeating the British Bulldogs for the world titles. People could not believe it. Countless times there have been heel teams that didn't seem like there, there's any way they were going to win the titles over the dominant over popular champions. And they did. They did. I'm sure if the internet existed back then, there would have been a whole lot of bitching about those kind of matches. And there were more than the two I named. There would have been a whole lot of bitching about it. But you know what? Get over yourself, IWC. I think it's going to happen. I think it needs to happen. I think the acclaim needs to be challenged. It doesn't mean they can't win the belts back for crying out loud. That's how wrestling works. You know, you lose, you win, you lose, you win. That's how it works. And I think it would be amazing to see these two strong talented veterans that showed you they can work a classic tag team match win the titles off these guys i mean cheat that cheat the hell out of them whatever in the end but get the titles have this crowd lose their mind seeing jeff jarrett walk around with, as a world champion again 
I, I think it's money. I think it works. I think it gives the acclaimed something to, to bitch about and shoot for. It's something to lift them up higher, working to veterans like this, getting in there, being coached by the amazing Billy Gunn, Billy Gunn being schooled by the amazing Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal, who's not hasn't been around quite as long, of course, but he's a veteran as well, former Ring of Honor world champion, uh, multi-time champion in Ring of Honor, just an incredible wrestler that doesn't get near enough credit. Jarrett and Lethal started this at Ric Flair's last match pay-per-view, and Tony Khan was smart enough to see how great they were together and brought them in. Keep the push going, Tony. Get the titles on these guys. I think it's money. I think the Acclaim would have something to fight for, even bigger than themselves, especially now that they've already faced FTR, for crying out loud, and the Elite are focused on the, on the Trios championships. This is a classic babyface team versus the vile heels that will do anything to win. And it's great. I loved it. This show was a, a 9 out of 10. I enjoyed the hell out of this show. The opening uh, Battle Royal was terrific. Jade Cargill's match, eh, it was all right. This main event was terrific. Uh, it was just, it was a great wrestling show. A one-hour wrestling show, perfect time. Gives me enough time to process this. I didn't have to spend forever on this show editing it, even though you know I work hard for you guys. This was a little easier to do. And I can't wait till Dynamite on Wednesday. Of course, I will be talking about Dark Elevation and Dark on my social media, both Twitter and Facebook. And you can find the links to them at WrestlingDoneRight.com. Follow me at both places. Okay, my um, I don't really do friend requests on Facebook. I'm not saying if you figure out how to send me one that I won't accept it. I, I prefer people to have, you know, 10 or more mutual friends. It's hard for me to approve anybody as a friend without that. But... All my posts are public because I am a public figure. It's a business Facebook now. So everything I post is public. You can just click the follow button and you'll be able to interact with me, comment on my posts, whatever. Help me share them, guys. I really need them shared. Even if you disagree with me, share them. Say, hey, this guy's crazy, isn't he? And put it out there and see what other people had to say. I, any way you share my stuff, I'll appreciate. I really will. Just like I appreciate you showing up for this, giving me the likes, giving me the shares. Most of all, if you'd subscribe... It would make my day. It would be a wonderful Christmas gift. And guys, Merry Christmas. It's coming in about five and a half hours. Get to bed before Santa Claus comes or you won't get your gifts. <laughs> and I will see you real soon because I will be back covering everything AEW before you know it. And I'll see you then.